Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the scheduler and load balancing in rel 8 um, and, and beyond a little bit upstream as well. Um, so first, uh, just a quick rundown, um, short biography about me. Um, we'll have a little introduction to the scheduler and load balancing in general, and then I want to focus a little bit on a case study for a specific issue in the load balancing that um, has been addressed recently in, in RHEL 8 minor releases. Um, and then finally, we'll spend a little time looking at a couple of future features uh, in the upstream scheduler that we're hoping to have in RHEL at some point, whether it's RHEL 8 or RHEL 9, depends a little bit on when they land and how invasive they turn out to be. Um, and then I have some more info and links and, and whatnot uh, at the end. So. All right, so uh, a little bit about me just to get started. So I am the uh, maintainer and product owner uh, for the scheduler component of the rail kernel at this point. And uh, I've been doing that for a couple of years now for about about as long as I've been at, at Red Hat, I guess. Um, there's still lots to learn for me. It's a it's a new area that I haven't spent a lot of time with. So I'm it's it's quite interesting and there's a lot going on, but there's definitely a lot, a lot of intricate bits to to learn. Um, I've been working myself. I've been working with the Linux kernel since since way back in the day. Um, I've done some network driver work, some Zen. I worked on some I/O virtualization stuff. Um, I wrote a multipath driver at one point before the MD multipath came about. Um, worked in some memory management pieces and various other bits. Um, but as I said, I'm I'm somewhat new to the scheduler, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's an interesting area. So get right into it. So um, the scheduler is basically it's it's components of the kernel that determine when tasks run and where they run and for how long they run. Um, it, it establishes the methods for the mechanism. It's the mechanism that, that we use to share the processing resources um, in the kernel. And one of the main Components of it is what's called the FAIR SCED class. And most of what we're going to be talking about today deals with the, the, the FAIR SCED class. Um, and this gets its name from the completely FAIR scheduler, uh, also known as CFS, um, which, which is the implementation of what this, this main sort of normal scheduling is. This is the kind of scheduling pro, uh, class that you get, behavior that you get with just when you spawn a normal task. And, and most, of, most of the tasks running on your system um, are, are running in, in SCED normal or what's SCED other, um, as it's also called. Um, so in addition to determining when tasks run, which is for how long and swapping them out when, when it's time to switch to a new task and whatnot, um, the, the where, where tasks run is, is a, the provenance of the scheduler as well. And this happens in, in code called load balancing. Um, and so the goal of the scheduler is, especially in, in modern systems where, you know, there's multiprocessors where back, back when we had a single processor, the where didn't matter so much, right? But um, now uh, with multiple processors, it, it makes a, a much, much bigger difference. You have to spread the load um, across all the processors as much as possible. So. Um, and, and that's the goal of the, the scheduler, really, is it, it, it's what's called a work conserving scheduler. And the idea is that there should, if there's a task to run, we should find a CPU and a CPU to run it on. We should find a CPU. We should move it to that CPU and we should we should get it running rather than having idle CPUs while you have uh, work that, that can be done. Um, but now there are some constraints that affect how this load balancing can work. Um, these could be. Uh, CPU affinity that's set by user space tasks may be configured to only run on certain CPUs, some sub subset of CPUs or something. Um, there are also kernel tasks that are uh, kernel threads that are pinned to specific CPUs. Obviously, they are going to run on the CPU they're pinned on only. They can't be moved. Um, there can also be power and frequency constraints. So you could have uh, processors in a very very deep sleep state, you may, may and you had a short task to run, you may run that on a ta uh, CPU that is not quite as deep, deeply asleep so that you have better latency and you don't have to bring a CPU, bring the frequency up of a CPU or bring a CPU out of sleep. Um, there could be a system with um, 
asymmetric multiprocessing system with like a big little system where you have some processors are more powerful than others and you may want to run small tasks on the small cpus larger tasks on the larger cpus um, another feature of uh, another constraint rather that that can affect load balancing is the non-uniform memory access systems where you have multiple NUMA nodes, um, you may want to move the task to where its memory is in one NUMA node rather than moving the memory to the task. Um, so some, some of these things play into how, how and where we can move tasks. But in general, the idea is to spread the tasks out as much as possible. Um, the, the code in the scheduler tends to be performance critical in, in various ways, um, not just in the load balancing. It's, it's a very hot path. Um, the, the scheduler code is very hot path in the kernel. And so there are often trade-offs that are involved where you can make it better for one workload, but it's worse for another workload. And this applies also, as I said, to more than just the load balancing. Um, but but it, there's there's often a balance we try to try to keep where where we get, you know, generally the best across the board that we can do without uh, overly penalizing one workload versus another, favoring one workload ver versus another. So there are def definitely trade-offs involved. All right. Um, so let's go on to the next thing. So so to look at the issue that I'm that I'm talking about, it uh, it comes from this paper called uh, it came out about four years ago, five years ago now, I guess. Um, uh, called the decade of wasted cores. It was a bunch of several researchers in in France and Canada, I believe. I have a uh, a link to the paper later on in the in the deck, so you can get the actual details of it. Um, but what happens is they they studied the the Linux scheduler and came up and found these four. I think it was basically four issues um, in the current implementation of the scheduler, and three of which were fairly straightforward and easy fixes and went into upstream kernel around the time the paper came out. Um, but there was this other issue that uh, ended up being called C group imbalance. And, excuse me. So what, what this, this uh, issue is, is if you have multiple C groups on the system, you can, cause the load balancer to work badly um, if there are more tasks in one and and very busy tasks in an, in another one of the c and few busy tasks in in other c groups um so for the case we're looking at this is actually a um, setup that's specifically designed to trigger this so it's it's going to use three c groups we're going to run a benchmark a multi-threaded benchmark in one of the c groups and then we're going to run a CPU hog in each one, each in the other two C groups. So we're going to have um, a number of threads running CPU bound workload with with timing measurements um, in one C group. And then we're going to put single single processes in the other C groups. Um, and we're going to see that the uh, load balancing does not do uh, what we'd really like it to do. And we're going to do that by looking at some nice pictures. So, um, so this is what this is is a uh, heat map that is generated by some tools which our Perf team, uh, Perf QE team, came up with, um, based on the work in the in the paper I mentioned above. And so what this is is a uh, forty-eight CPU system. So there, if you see on the left, that's the uh, the, the the y-axis is the CPUs going from zero to 47 on the two NUMA nodes, and there are two nodes. So there's, you know, 20, 23, uh, zero to 23 on node zero, and and then up on on the other node, on node one. So there are 48 CPUs total, um, and what we're tracking here is the number of running processes on the run queue of each of these CPUs. And in Linux, the number of processes in the run queue includes the one that's running on the CPU. So when we have this at one, which is the blue color, that means there is one process running on that CPU. Um, black, of course, here is uh, idle. So these CPUs are idle um, on, the, in, on the node zero there, sort of in the middle of the picture you can see. And uh, the hotter colors above blue 
um, as you can see in node one in the middle, corresponding to the idle sections below um, are when we have multiple processes queued on this on one of these CPUs. And that means that there are processes waiting. So what really should happen is these processes over here should be filling in this black space and everything should be basically blue uh, in this in this picture. So this this is running um, our our uh, benchmark process. It's from the NAS parallel benchmark suite and it's the LU program. It's running 44 threads. So there are 44 tasks running in that one C group and two CPU burning. So that's 46 out of our 48 CPUs. So this these long stretches of idle you can see that run across are sort of expected because we should have two CPUs um, that, that are basically idle in this system at this point. Um, and across the bottom, of course, is time. The time doesn't isn't all that interesting as in specifically in this in this case as it it shows it's more to show the the heat map because it gives you a good visualization of of what's happening um, and so this is what it looked like about the from the time of the paper up through uh what we shipped in rel a2 um and it was the upstream kernel uh prior to v55 so this is basically what you would see running this test and this this led leads to a fairly significant overall, this is not an especially bad one, but this leads to a fairly significant performance degradation for the, the results of the actual benchmark itself in this case, um, uh, up to, it can run up to one tenth as fast as it does um, in the normal case, because it's not able to run, it's it's a CPU bound workload and it's it's these these processes up here on the top half are, are waiting and, and work is, is not being done. All right, so if we go to 8.3, this is the exact same test um, on the 8.3 kernel. And what's different here is that um, in 5.5, Vincent Guito did a rework of the load balancer. And one of the things that it does is it solves this problem because instead of looking at the load of a system strictly, at the load, it, it actually takes into account the number of running processes um, as well when it's going to make its load balancing decisions. Um, so what was happening in the previous picture has to do with the way the uh, C group scheduling works and the way it calculates load. Um, in order to keep everything fair, the load a process uh, applies to a system and it, the, the measurement of the load of a process is divided by the number of processes in the C group that it's in. So in our C group with the 44 threads, those CPU bound processes were taking 1 44th the amount of load or claimed to have 1 44th the amount of load as the CPU burning uh, CPU hogs that were running you know, as singletons in their in their C groups. Um, and so when it was doing its load balancing calculations, it's using that number, um, which is which is skewed because of the, the group scheduling policy. Um, and in this case, the uh, load balancer now looks at the number of running processes uh, first, and it only uses that load calculation uh, for fairness cases when the system is really overloaded. Um, which is not the case in uh, in this uh, setup because we have, as I said, 46 tasks using 48 CPUs. So it really shouldn't be overloaded. So it should be strictly looking at the um, number of running tasks per CPU. And you can see, basically, it's all blue, and we've got more or less two. This guy, you know, the, the idle is moving around a little bit here, but we have more or less two full threads of idle. And, and 46 CPUs um, in use. And so that looks a lot better, doesn't it? Um, we think we're all we're all done. Everything's good now and we can go on. Oh, and the performance is back to what it should be. So you get the same performance now with the C group case and without. Um, but we're not quite there yet because if we look at this next graph, this is still on 8.3. Um, this is with 24 threads in the 
benchmark case. So still two two CPU burners in their own C groups. And now instead of 44, we have 24 threads, which means there's a lot more idle, as you can see. But there's also this interesting um, saw blade sort of behavior, which you can see pretty clearly in the visualization here. Um, and what this involves, uh, what this means is we've got tasks that are, they're just moving back and forth from the from node to node, right? There's a steady number of tasks in the system and they're just getting migrated back and forth between, uh, between the two NUMA nodes. Now, the end result of this is only a couple percentage point performance difference. I mean, there is a, there is a cost, there'll be some cash, you know, some cash damage um, by, by moving the, the processes away. Um, it wasn't quite as obvious without the um, without the visualization. You don't, you wouldn't, might not even have noticed because the the, the difference wasn't quite as great. Um, but this is still not not really what we want. Um, and so what's happening here is I mentioned that there's the two NUMA nodes, right? There's actually two pieces of code that do load balancing at the NUMA level in the kernel. There's the schedule load balancer itself, which is what we talked about before and what we fixed um, in the in the 8.3 kernel and the and the 5.5 upstream kernel. Um, but there is also this auto NUMA balancing, which specifically um, can balance tasks and move tasks at the NUMA level. And with the 5.5 kernel still and 8.3 here, the um, the NUMA balancing code is not using the same logic as the new load balancer. And so what we have here is they're basically fighting with each other. So you have the uh, load balancer trying to fix the balance across the NUMA nodes and you have the NUMA balancer trying to put them back and, and, and vice versa. And you end up with this saw blade effect. Um, so in about 5.9 and coming out in 8.4 when it comes out, um, Mel Gorman, who does a lot of the NUMA balancing, the, new, the NUMA work, um, Wrote, wrote a patch series that we took in 8.4 that brings the logic, makes the logic the same so that the uh, NUMA balancer and the load balancer and the scheduler basically use the same criteria to figure out what to move and, and how to do their load balance. So they don't fight with each other anymore. And in that case, we get something like this, which is a lot better. The tasks are not moving around. They're still moving at startup because they all sort of start on node zero, you can see at the, the very left, um, but then they just get moved. And then basically from then on, um, everything is pretty, pretty even and balanced. All right, so anyway, I thought those were interesting set of uh, traces that you can use to see really what the load balancer, what the load balancer is doing. Um, and here's a little bit more detail about how we did that. This is the a point of the first thing is the NAS parallel benchmarks. That's a pointer to the um, test suite that we were running. The trace point itself is was added to the 5.9 kernel and we it actually only lives in 8.4 as far as rail is concerned, but we backported it to the other kernels just to, to do these tests. Um, but it's also, it's a raw trace point, so it's not a full trace event. Um, so it requires a an external module to turn it into a full trace event so your trace command tools and, and stuff can actually access it access it directly and these are pointers to um, this module um, this top one is my version which is just a, a fork of, of Kay's Yousef's version that had a bunch of other trace points in the scheduler area that used the same mechanism to, to make them usable uh, usable trace events so I just added added to that, and and it's been pushed upstream. So this this bottom one um, also has the trace event mechanism for for the number of running tracking, um, and the graphs here were made by this tool, um, plot number running by Jiri Vozar, who's a member of our Perf QE QE team. Um, and while I'm here, I just want to do a quick shout out to uh, Yerka Chlaki, who uh, has been a great help with this and actually did the work to give give me the tool to run this to, to do the setup for running the tests uh, that, that you saw in the first the first slide 
Okay, so we got just a couple minutes here. I'll go very fairly quickly through these pieces and leave some time for questions if there are any. Um, so a couple of future features that we're looking at um, that are going to be interesting. There's this um, latency nice feature. It's not going to be called that because it's not really going to be quite as parallel to to the nice functionality that's in the kernel already. But this, this is a way to tell the scheduler that um, your process is uh, latency sensitive. And there are things about in the wake up path and whatnot that can be that the scheduler, if it knows that you're trying, if your task is latency, latency sensitive, it can it can try to, to play into that and make it and make give it better latency. Um, this will probably end up being more of a switch than a, than a knob of, of uh, multiple values, but we will see. I think I think that'll be interesting for some workloads. And uh, so Linux Weekly News article that that's pretty up to date, talking about that. Um, oops, sorry. Um, there's some work being done in the isolation mechanism, which is also basically part of the scheduler in the, in a lot of ways. And um, one of the things it can do is is turn off the timer tick. In, on a CPU, so you can set no hertz full, and you can set a CPU isolated, which will try to move move all the other threads off of that off of that CPU. So you can run your really run your workload, you know, in, in complete isolation on a CPU. Um, the problem is that it's it's um, it's boot time configurable, right? So you can't change it at runtime. And there's a certain amount of interest, um, especially in like the container uh, container virtualization stacks and stuff, to be able to change this configuration at, at runtime. So there's some work ongoing there. Um, there isn't, I haven't seen a, th there are pieces, there isn't really a, a comprehensive project sort of to do this. So I don't have a good link to point to anything for that. Um, there's also another way to do isolation, which is this task isolation mode. And they're sort of related. Um, this is a process to uh, a project interrupt yeah. you but uh, we have a question here and okay. uh, we have three minutes to go so i'll read it okay. out uh how do you measure the cpu utiliza utilization without interference from the program that is actually measuring uh the observer effect or is it negligible um you mean for the for the tracing for the pictures that we're looking at i assume i guess uh, yeah so I haven't measured that specifically. It's fairly, it's fairly negligible. It's the, it's the kernel's tracing. I mean, it, it, the, the kernel has, has these, uh, these, I don't remember. It's the uh, F trace events that, that it uses that are, they're fairly, they're fairly lightweight and they don't add a lot. There, there is definitely some interference. Um, I didn't want to point that out, but I think some of the, if I just quickly go back. So I think some of these little green dots that you can see where there's an extra process running. You know, some of that may be the um, the trace command threads that are that are waking up to uh, to to record the data, but the overhead of actually tracing using the trace points is is very low. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any other question? Uh, feel free to post it into a Q and A. Uh, we still have five minutes to go, and then uh, we can move to the Discord in uh, the room, session room two, and uh, you can ask uh, there after the talk ends. Right. All right, sounds good. So let me just, uh, if there aren't any more questions yet, let me just mention that also um, core scheduling is, is an interesting feature that, that I wanted to make sure I got a mention in here. Um, that this is a way to um, have the scheduler enforce that only tasks that trust each other will run on the siblings of a hyper-threaded core at the same time. Um, it's originally a security feature. There's some other pieces that are needed to make it really fully work as a security feature, um, but but there's definitely some interest there, and and it's it's getting close to being merged. I'm not sure yet when it will be in. There's still some interface work being done. Um, I believe it's in Peter Z's Q, Q at this point. So maybe 512 or 513, it might actually land. And uh, our time is up. So 
Okay. Thank you for your talk, Philip, and uh, see you next time.